enough of yourself that you seem like a real person. You know? We all have different different persons that we play, right? You know, the person at home that you play at home is not the same person that you you play when you're out networking or doing a business deal. Is not the same person you play uh, with a particular group of friends uh, down the pub. That might be different to uh, the, the person you play with a different group of friends. You know, we all have these sort of. They're still us. We're made up of these faceted personalities, and I, I kind of try and get people to find a, a presentation person. That's Duncan Yellowlees. Duncan is a professional public speaking coach. He trains people how to find their kind of speaker persona, your mask, that will be your speaker mask, because we all wear different masks depending on where we are in a particular point in time. So there is a speaker persona inside of you. And that's what Duncan does. He unlocks that and he nurtures that and he trains you how you can show up in front of people and get recognized as still being you, but you have something a little bit extra added to your personality where you're able to speak to people as well as being yourself. Duncan makes some really excellent points in this interview where he shares how you need to be showing up with integrity and authenticity in order to get recognised as still being you, but being able to deliver a talk with passion and emotion. And he even talks about, you know, find a subject that you're really passionate about and show up as that person. Fabulous story, fabulous interview, some really great tips. Enjoy. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Welcome to the Share Your Story podcast, Duncan. How are you today? I'm very well, Michael. Thanks. Uh, I'm here. It's a, it's a sunny day in Newcastle, as it happens for once. And uh, yeah, no, it's been nice. Snap, yeah. Well, I'm in the Midlands and it's a sunny day here too. I think we're hey, we're enjoying start. some dry weather for a change in the UK. <laughs> Absolutely, a smooth start to 2020. Absolutely. Here's to more of it. <laughs> that's it, that's it. Well, I, I, um, I'm really f looking forward to chatting with you today because you're a fellow storyteller. I um, am indeed. That's what I, yeah, I like that. So we're, we're going to be talking a lot about stories. And of course, we want to get started with hearing your story to begin with. So um, I will ask the question I ask everybody who comes on the podcast. Tell us a little bit about your personal life to begin with. So where were you born? A um, bit about your education. Have you moved around where you live? Um, all of those good things, you know, your schooling and then how you will talk about how you got into your career. We just want to know the story, Duncan. So over to you. Uh, OK, so I was I was born in Bristol, uh, but don't uh, we moved away from there when I was very little. So I uh, although I know it's a lovely city. I haven't been back and don't really associate with it. Uh, we, we moved north uh, with a short stop off in Newcastle. Um, and then I did most of my growing up and childhood in the Scottish borders. Wow. Uh, in the central side of the Scottish borders. Uh, so we moved there when I was about four, I think. Uh, so I kind of, uh, although I'm not technically Scottish, I sort of associate with being Scottish. Yes. Uh, and some of that, that identity. And I, and I think almost storytelling actually maybe started with that sort of concept. But. Yeah, so that was that was that, and I went to went to school in a little town uh, called Erlston in the Scottish Borders, in the Central Scottish Borders, and I had a pretty good time of it. Really, um, I got involved with theatre stuff uh, when I was about fourteen, right. uh, and that that stayed constant through through most of my next kind of decade, uh, doing lots of theatre. So youth theatre there really formed my. A friendship group growing up and my, my teenage friend group. I didn't have, uh, you know, a big, a big group of friends at school, but it was the weekends and the school holidays. We'd all get together doing, doing youth theatre programs through a scheme called Borders Youth Theatre, which was fantastic. Mm. Um, uh, and then, and at school, I was always interested in science. Uh, my dad 
uh, had an engineering degree and then went into medicine and my mum's a doctor as well. Uh, my stepmother's a statistician, so kind of maths and science has always been uh, there and around. So I had this yes. sort of dual uh, interest growing up. I was very, very sciencey and I loved physics uh, and chemistry, but not so much. Uh, math, although I, I did it, uh, and uh, mm-hmm. and the theatre, theatre and the arts, and uh, a big love of history and finding out those stories of the past and uh, learning about that kind of stuff. Uh, so yeah, a little bit of a, a dual uh, dual thing going on. People are sometimes surprised that uh, I, I've got this much sort of sciencey stuff in me, as well as being uh, a storyteller and interesting language and, and connection and communication. But uh, I guess then it was the it was the science that took over because that was the one that was gonna gonna get me a, a really strong job, right? As yes, of think, course. <laughs> that's what you think when you're a teenager. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I uh, I went to Edinburgh University uh, and did engineering, uh, mechanical engineering with renewable energy. I was going to save the world. That was going to be the plan. I could see this whole green electricity being being a big deal, and I mm. wanted to get get in with that. Uh, and four years of university persuaded me that I, I don't like maths enough to be a, a proper engineer. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's honest, at least. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, it was, it was, I got to the point where, I, I don't know if there's any mathematicians or engineers are listening, but I got to the point where I could, I could, I could do the maths enough to get to pass the exams, and I could see sort of just, just over this philosophical hill, maths got sort of fun for its own sake. Yeah. And, and kind of easy to understand and work with, almost like people work with uh, languages. And I could see it, and I knew I was never going to get there. Um, <laughs> so I, I, just, I decided possibly this wasn't for me. But again, the theatre had, had really kicked in in Edinburgh. Um, the student theatre scene in Edinburgh is, is really big, obviously, with the Edinburgh Fringe, right. uh, which for listeners who don't know is, is the biggest arts festival in the world, which happens in Edinburgh every August. And it's a, a month of theatre and dance and comedy and art and uh, all sorts of interesting and amazing creative stuff happening. So, uh, you know, as a child, we would we'd be taken up to Edinburgh during the Fringe to, to see shows. And then at university, I got involved with the student societies and I ended up working at the Edinburgh Fringe for a bit. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, doing technical theatre stuff. So stage management and lighting. Yes, and, yes. And that kind of, kind of side of things. Uh, I got into doing that uh, and a bit of pocket money over the holidays. Uh, but then in my in my final year at Edinburgh, I directed a production of Wind in the Willows at the Fringe, uh, mm. which was very exciting. Um, and yeah, I don't quite know how I did it. I look back and I count. I did something like 22, 23 shows over the four years I was, I was at university, um, which is, uh, yeah. So I spent almost all of my spare time in theatres uh, either as an actor or the kind of managing it directing it organizing it what all yeah of it. so <laughs> well yeah kind of all of it actually so i i youth theatre is very much on on stage and doing the acting thing and that was right know, I, I am uh, i've been known to show off every now and, <laughs> and that was a, a comfortable space for me but then at edinburgh i i started switching and tried to go to directing quite early on, decided I really liked directing. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the kind of technical stuff, the stage management stuff came in, uh, partly because as a director, I wanted to know what I was asking of my teams. You know, if I say, yes, I want the set to look like this, or I need the, the sound to be like this, and the lights need to go like this. And if, uh, you know, if they said no, I needed to know when they would be uh, uh, bullshitting me uh, so I could say, yes, you can do it, or how far I could push them on what I could ask for people. Yes. People. Um, and, and creativity, you know, creatively, what sort of how far I could push it, you know, if I was having ideas that were, were beyond the scope of what we could achieve. Yeah. But I also, I really like it. I've got a, a strong practical streak in me as well that likes that, you know, uh, wearing tools and work boots and, and building things and that kind of stuff. So I, I've, I've enjoyed all of it. The one bit I've never done is the, is the production bit and the, the kind of product man- project management and right. design finances and that stuff. I was always on the creative side. Yes. Uh, kind and, of thing, training actors. Yeah. And because your, your, your parents and step parents are very sciencey and doctors and whatever. Is there, is there any history going further back in the family where there were the creativity on, you know, acting or theater and storytelling? 
So um, in the in that sort of side of things, I think a couple of generations back, I've got a, a great great grandmother who was a concert cellist. Right. Um, traveled all over the world playing kind of concerts. Uh, I think she she sort of played some big concerts to entertain the troops during uh, World War Two. I think. Um, but we don't. I don't know masses about her. Um, it's it's the immediate set is medics going all the way back. Um, wow. and doctors, medical people going all the way back. So, but, yeah, yeah, so my, you're my, kind my, of going against the against the, the grain a little bit. Well, I think perhaps we all did. So I've got uh, my my two brothers of my two brothers. One of them is is an actor currently on the West End and oh. one is, is studying at Guildhall to become a, a professional jazz musician. So oh my God. <laughs> we've all we've all sort of spiraled away from that that sciencey background. I mean of all of our you know, all, all three of the sort of grown-ups, as it were, involved in my life, were, were creative in their own ways. Dad, as I say, is an engineer and like making things and fixing stuff. Yes. Uh, my, my stepmother, the mathematician, is uh, also a musician and, and played piano a bit. Right. Uh, which is why, so Innis, the littlest one, is my half-brother and he, he got into the piano. Right, uh, right, right. My, and mum's always been a sort of uh, soft crafter, so, you know, making candles and felting, and Christmas mm. cards. And all of that kind of stuff. So it's always, it's always been there. It's always been encouraged. We're always, okay. you know, yeah, encouraged to explore the creative side of life as well as the, the do the work and the exams and, and get good at science side of things. So did you? So the university thing. Did you? Did you stay the course? Did you stay the length of the? When you realised it's not really what you wanted to do. Yes. Yeah. I did. I uh, and I. I got to. I got to my. So in Scotland, you do four years of of university for an undergraduate degree yeah. and uh so i did those uh, four years i missed i was i was initially enrolled upon a uh, combined master's program that would have been five years and i missed uh, the, the score i needed to get onto the master's by one mark which is a little bit vexing uh by that point i decided oh. i didn't to do the masters anyway but i would i would have liked the choice yes <laughs> yes um but I, by that point, I was toying with the idea of, of doing theatre directing properly and going on to do a, a course and a degree in, in theatre direction. Right. Uh, but kind of had a bit of a reconsider and decided that I wanted to tell the stories of engineering through mm. theatre. So I wanted to tell the history of engineering through theatre, much like Brian Cox does for the stories of space. Ah. I wanted to be that. I wanted to be the Brian Cox of the history of engineering, which is a bit niche, perhaps. Yes. But uh, <laughs> there you go. Or actually, I, in my head, I had a young Fred Dibner. I don't know whether that name uh, will ring bells in no. the listeners. But it's not old, for me anyway. Not Who's for that? You. And there's an old um, British uh, communicator of industrial heritage, I guess, and he used to do TV programs where he, so I was an old boy from Yorkshire in a in a flat cap. Right. Uh, with sideburns, used to drive around on a, on steam engines and traction engines and blow right, up right. All, all kind of mining um, mining towers and that kind of stuff. And yes. I remember, it's, you know, something about watching one of those programs when I was a kid. It stuck, and he had this very friendly approach and very yeah. He was he was interested in the stories and the people and communicating that culture and heritage, particularly of the working working north in this country, which is where a lot of the industrial Yes. heritage yeah uh, so that was kind of who i had in my head and i thought well right, i should go off and go off and do that all right I, now i'm remembering back i think the trigger for that was during my last year at the edinburgh fringe i, I was working freelance as a stage manager mm. uh, and what happens is companies from america that want to come over kind of put postings out trying to find local support staff so stage management crew and technicians and that kind of thing yes and i'd answered one of these and it was for a, a little play called Yours, Isabel, which was about a soldier in the Second World War and his sweetheart back home exchanging letters, mm. sort of signed Yours, Isabel. And uh, about how it was, just, it was just a beautifully done play and I spent time with the, with the playwright and the way she talked about it. And, and I kind of went, this, you know, you can tell these amazing historical stories through theatre. And, and I knew through some of my reading and research and bits from my degree that the history and industrial heritage of, of the UK is littered with these wonderful characters and great stories. Yes. And, uh, and I think that's what prompted it. Anyway, I, for whatever sort of reason, I decided that I should go off and do that 
Uh, but I thought I should probably learn a bit about the history of science and the history of engineering to do it. So I, yes. uh, luckily, uh, very privileged and had the financial uh, support to go off and do a master's. Uh, so I did that in Manchester in the history of science, technology and medicine. Mm. It was the next step in the journey. So sli- starting to slide away from the hard engineering roots and the hard mm. maths mm. and slide into something a little bit different. Uh, so I was, yeah, I was in Manchester for a year and absolutely loved it. I, we had, uh, it was a taught masters and we did, we had a 5,000 word essay due in every two weeks. So I ended on a whole variety of subjects. Uh, so I ended up writing essays on, on, uh, blood transfusions and medical advances in the second world war and, uh, the great exhibition of 1952 uh, and how it compared to the, the great exhibition of 1852, which is a big science and technology fair in 1852 and a whole bunch of stuff and, and poisoning in the Victorian era and the beginnings of forensic science and a whole bunch of stuff, you know, com- really starting to combine this idea of my interest in science and finding out about the world with some of the stories embedded in the history of it and the people there. Um, but along that journey, I, I kind of discovered science communication as a thing yes. uh, that exists. It and does so exist. Then. It does exist. Yes. No, it's a, it's a big, well, I say a big industry. It's a, a medium sized industry all to its own. Yeah. Um, and it, I kind of thought, wow, oh, this is a, this is a thing. This could, tie together reasonably well with what I sort of want to do. And at the time I was still very interested in theater and my, my dissertation for my masters was, uh, looking at whether theater is a good medium for communicating science or Mm. not. Uh, it turns out not massively, um, Mm -hmm. or at least, at least at the level of research capable in masters in a master's dissertation. Uh, so, yeah, so I ended up with a with a science communication master's because we had that module on the course and I did the dissertation on that, so I got the kind of piece of paper with a tick on it that says science communication. I thought that was more likely to get me a job than the history of science. Um, and so it proved, but I had a really interesting conversation with the head of science at the BBC at the time when I was doing that master's. He was running an event and I, I went along and had a chat. And I can't remember quite what it was now, but something he said prompted me to think that maybe being behind the camera was a better place for me than in front of the So rather than being Brian Cox presenting on TV and doing the thing and telling these stories, yeah. actually being, you know, going back to that d- idea of being a director and, and writing the scripts and doing the research and that kind of thing, maybe that was a more interesting space for me. Yes. Um, so, uh, yeah, that, the Masters was, a, was another kind of transitional phase that changed my mind a little bit about quite what I wanted to be and what I wanted to do. Yeah. Uh, and then I finished that, um, and did what everybody does when finally they pop out of an education system and look around going, Oh, what do I do now? I've got to go and get a job and pay bills and, uh, so, and I've got this weird skill set at this point. I'm a, I'm an engineer with a history degree who likes, who likes theater. Yes. It's all, it's all a little bit odd. Uh, but I sort of settled on the museum sector. Uh, because that seemed to fit and initially looking at kind of steam museums and that kind of thing. And, uh, yeah, I was lucky enough to land a, a job at, uh, at the center for life science center in Newcastle, which is a bit like the science museum in London. It's that kind right. of, uh, space for the public to engage with, uh, science and scientific ideas in an exhibition space and with events yeah. and activity and that kind of stuff. And I got a job there, which was Absolutely perfect at the time. Oh my God, you landed on your feet then, didn't oh, you? I absolutely did. I can remember the day that I saw the job advert pop up and it, I was reading, you know, you, you need job hunting and you spend ages reading job applications that aren't yes. quite right. And you kind of think about how do I, how do I sort of squidge myself into this box? How do I, you know, if I phrase this like that, then I tick that thing mm, and I can, mm, I can mm. do that. Um, and I spent days and days you know, weeks looking through job ads like that and, and not hearing back from people. And then this job ad popped up and it had, the, the job was doing science communication. So talking about science, it was putting together theater shows 
uh, for to, to get that sign to cross. Yeah. Um, it was uh, technical skills involving building set and developing physical demonstrations and props when needed. And I got that from my, my theatre world as well. Yes. Uh, and training performers, so science graduates, to perform these shows and to deliver those to the public. And I, I'd spent time being a director and trying to get the most yeah. actors and performers. And I just saw it and went, that looks absolutely perfect. I, I want that one. Um, so <laughs> oh. I applied, I applied and, and got lucky and got it. People will be very depressed listening to that, going straight out of education and just the, getting into that role that is perfect. Yeah. Wow. I got, I got absolutely lucky. There's, there's, uh, there's uh, quite a lot of, there's a splash of luck and quite a lot of privilege uh, along my story supporting everything. And, uh, but also timing, you know, you, yes. I, they were looking for that sort of person at the right time. And, yes. you know, I, I put the work into the interview and yeah, it went well. I did, in fact, I did that thing where, where, you ring up and go, oh, I happen to be in Newcastle. Do you mind if I, I come say hi and visit? I was, I was nowhere near Newcastle. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, a few days before the interview, you know, a week before, can I come, come, come and visit and have a look around and have a chat? Uh, you know, in my back of my head thinking, here you go, start making a good impression. Start, you know, seeding, uh, seeding positive vibes about you and, and your boss to be. Uh, she was savvy to that and gave me a very cold shoulder. But... Um, <laughs> 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 uh, later became very good friends but yeah that's okay but no oh. I, I got that job and it was um it was brilliant oh well done well done and so how long did you stay did you stay obviously you're not you're not still there are you with them no 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 uh, no so i i stayed i stayed with them for three and a half years um in that role and you know because the point where i was i was sort of you know, no matter how good a job is, you get a bit done with it after a while. I think, sure. or at, least, at least I do. I think I'm quite a uh, flighty is perhaps the wrong word, but I'm an obsessive. I bounce around things right, and get really into them and do them really well and for a little bit and then get a bit bored and want to move on again. Mm, mm. Uh, and I do that in quite a lot of areas of my life, actually. But uh, that, yeah, so I stayed there for three and a half years and I had, had great times and did all sorts of stuff. My head is full of sort of uh, in other industries and in other world, useless bits of information about how to demonstrate fun bits of science and how to safely set various things on fire and yeah. uh, how best to show uh, angular momentum or rocket motion or laws of physics or bioluminescent plankton or, you know, why your beach ball goes bang if you leave it in the back of the car on a hot sunny day. Um, uh, yeah, so lots of three years accumulating loads of knowledge in that, but also learning quite a lot about uh, how to engage people. Right. Uh, so I, I had this I had this theatre background, and when I went and I started at the Centre for Life, I very much thought I knew it all. Uh, perhaps, mm -hmm. well, definitely, definitely arrogant. I knew perhaps about it. Uh, <laughs> um, but, <laughs> but, you know, I'd done this Master's in Science Communication, and I'd studied the history of it, and I, I understood theatre, and I was being asked to do these theatre shows, and yes. I was absolutely Convinced that I knew the right way to do it, which uh, absolutely made me a bit obnoxious, I think, uh, to start with to some of the people working there. Yes. Uh, who've, who've since warmed up to me uh, and are good friends. Uh, but yeah, I didn't. Started with that, that confidence. That's good. Uh, In a way, you know, the thing is, sometimes it helps um, to have that level of confidence to kind of push yourself through. I mean, it's a metaphor for, you know, starting your own business as well. You, you got to have a level of confidence about yourself. Otherwise you will never get started. Um, no, indeed you, you, you've got to go for it. But then, then of course, as we, uh, I don't know, the most important lesson is to, is to listen to other people, isn't it? And, Correct. And, learn from the expertise. And, and that's when, you know, I had a very a good manager there and, uh, learned quite fast. She, she let me make, you know, she did the thing where she, she let me make a couple of mistakes. Mm. Uh, I felt sufficiently mortified by that. I would then listen to all advice. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, it was, it's a long story involving 10,000 ice cubes, uh, and a freezer and yeah, all getting a bit long, long nights filling ice cube trays with ice cubes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so she, she taught me quite a lot about, uh, you know, that and being open to ideas, and learning from other people and, she herself had a background in more traditional storytelling rather than theatre. Right. And 
And I learned a lot about some of the techniques from that and certainly a lot about training people and thinking about engaging the public with science, engaging people with different ideas about this concept that it, it, it's not really about information. Mm. Um, it's about memory making and emotional engagement and, yes. and that sort of stuff. Uh, I think my, and this was my dissertation, had, had sort of come up with this idea that uh, theatre is not great for information transfer. No. no. Live delivery. You know, if anybody's ever been to a talk or a presentation or a lecture, they'll know that, that you know, if you, 10 minutes afterwards, if somebody asked you what you learned or what you took away, you'd be able to remember one thing. If that, you know, it's not great for information transfer, but that kind of live delivery with somebody in front of you is really good for emotional engagement and generating a connection. Yes. Yeah. So that's the kind of stuff that I learned, I learned there. Uh, and then they started uh, farming me out to the local university here in Newcastle to do training with researchers right? Uh, in public engagement. Uh, so the various departments in the university were looking for people to train them in, in public engagement. And so I started getting experience of that side of things and ran a program while I was there called Bright Club, uh, which is a fantastic program in which academics do eight minutes of stand-up comedy based around their research, uh, <laughs> which is, it's fabulous. There's a, if, if listeners have not come across it and it sounds like your kind of bag, look it up. There's one in most of the cities across the UK uh, and some, some international as well, I think, in Australia and America. And... Uh, yeah, so finding finding different ways to communicate or think about the research, and I ran that program. And to start with, we did the training in conjunction with a with a comedian, a professional comedian. So through listening to the way they were training people, I learned some of what comedy is about and how you get people to laugh. And lo and behold, it's all about emotional engagement. Yeah, um, uh, it's, you know, and I kind of realised that they were using the same. Uh, um, tricks, triggers, bits of psychology that we were using to engage the public in science. The comedians are doing the same thing, but, but to get laughs. Uh, and I, I sort of slowly became fascinated by this idea that somewhere there's a, a core thing about the way human beings interact and the stuff we pay attention to and don't pay attention to and how we engage that, that spans storytelling and comedy and science and communication and you know, having a chat with your friend versus giving a TED talk. You know, there's something, there's a core to what we will and what we won't pay attention to and why we do and why we don't. Yeah. That kind of fascinates me. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so I stayed there for three and a half years. Uh, I tried to continue with it in that industry. You know, as I, I mentioned, science communication is an industry. There's the science centers and museums, there's all the freelancers and, and various organizations around the country that support it. But, you know, I wasn't right, quite right for any of the roles I went for. Uh, disillusioned with the job search, none of those roles kind of, yeah, fit me. I wasn't quite the right fit for them, uh, which is fine. But uh, it goes on, and I thought, well, you know, maybe maybe time to go off and do do something else, and maybe I can I can do something on my own. Uh, right. But yeah, which was uh, you know, I had this skill set. I recognised that me particularly training with the universities was something that I could do independent of of life, independent of that organisation. I'd recognized that what people liked about me delivering training was, was the way I did it rather than the content and the information. You know? um, this kind of stuff, presentation skills, uh, public engagement, the, the content is about well, any training, I guess, whether it's IT services or, or whatever, the content isn't really that unique. People tend to get drawn to particular training providers and the way they do it or particular personalities that they gel with. And yes. uh, I kind of, kind of clocked that people seemed to like what I was doing. Something about the way I did it was was positive. So I, I thought that would be a thing that I could I could do. Great. Yeah. But it, yeah, it wasn't it wasn't a straightforward <laughs> step into the unknown. No. I kind of decide, decided that I wanted to do this, and at about the about the same time, again another another bit of a uh, combination of luck and privilege come in, and I did a so. Oh, to backtrack a story, my dad years and years ago when he was studying to be an engineer had a, an idea for an invention uh, and he sort of kept it on the back burner in the back of his head for the last 40 years and he'd met somebody and got chatting and chatting about that and that person happened to have a bit of cash and be looking to invest in new ideas and stuff. So I uh, essentially did a, did a sort of Dragon's Den classic innovation invention project with angel right. investors for six months. 
And when when Dad approached me with this idea, because uh, he's he's got another he's running another business as well, and so he said, you know, you want something to do? We need somebody who can work on this. Let's negotiate in some of this investment a bit of a salary for you. So uh, I did that for eight months, uh, and that let with this with a salary, but working more or less completely on my own. Um, as the only person in this company doing kind of doing the work as the other directors, but but me doing the work. Um, back to my design engineering roots and problem solving and trying to think about that. So I sort of took eight months out of the engagement storytelling communication space almost completely. Yes. Um, but the goal was always to use that project to put aside a bit of money to mean that I could start out doing the freelance mm-hmm. training thing right. uh, or my own training company. Uh, you know, you Google this stuff and they say, to start your own business, it's it's really worth having six months cash in the bank. Yes. If you don't get any work for six months, you will still be okay. Yes. Um, and I'd read that somewhere. It's, it's stuck with me ever since. And that was that was the goal. It was use this this innovation project, this, this investment to get me a salary, Got save you. enough of that salary to get yeah. the six months to start. And so I did a kind of staggered mm, step rather mm. than a big step into the into the emptiness. That's a very sensible approach, actually. It's it's something when I started, I didn't do, and okay. it hurts. <laughs> you know, I can imagine. Yeah, it it really did hurt. I, I won't go through the whole stories, but yeah, I I was a bit cocky and a bit like, yeah, I can make this happen. This is just going to happen for me, you know, and it didn't. And yeah, it was. I mean, also, I worked in corporate life for a long time, so I had no idea of small business, running your own thing and where you have to do literally everything, you know, where you you don't have a team of people working for you that you can just delegate stuff to. And uh, it was a it was a big wake up call for me. So to, to get some money in the bank. You know, anybody that's listening, it's a really good idea to do because you may well need to call on that at some stage. Um, Absolutely. I did. I think anything, I mean, anything that can can make that the process from full time employment to full time self employed or running your own company, anything you can do to uh, do that in small steps almost rather yes. than one big, you know, the, the or rather the full jump from. I have regular cash flow and regular income to I've got, you know, after this month, I've got nothing. Um, and the existential crisis that comes with that. Anything you can do to slow that down or do that in, in steps and let yourself find the clients and work while still having some sort of financial support, I think is a good thing. I'm, yeah. I'm, I love I love running my own company. I love, I love doing this thing. And I encourage people to do it, but do it with a a real awareness that it's it, it can be risky and for lots of people it goes wrong mm. and mm. anything you can do to mitigate that risk somehow you know go go slowly it's not all about jumping in the deep end uh you know think it through and try and make sure it's going to work and and how long have you been on your own now <clears throat> uh so i've been this is the start of year three for me as a, a full-time right. doing the doing presentation coaching and training yeah and um, so eight with eight months before that as a solo worker doing other things. So that was the other thing, not just the money, you know, psychologically I'd went from working in a, in a team with a four or five where we all got on and we, we yeah. could bounce ideas off each other and we could call each other on stuff when we were going down the wrong track and, you know, really good, a good relationship for a creative company. And then, and then to being on my own in a little office mm. space with, you know, nothing and nobody to talk to. And mm. uh, yeah, that's a big shift as well. Um, so uh, yeah, so I guess two two years and about eight months I've been uh, completely working on my own. Eight months on the innovation, and then two four years running my business. So this Fantastic. is the start of the three. Congratulations! That's thank awesome. you very much. That's brilliant. Thank so you. okay, so let's let's dive a bit deeper then into as a training organization how you help people. Cool. Uh, so I, I help people by helping them tell their stories, really. Uh, so getting and helping them to do it in a way that, that gets to the messages quickly and, and gets presentations to do what they want. So I'm, I'm 
you know, you see, you see lots of people out there who will help you tell your stories, everything from, from blogging and writing and marketing. Uh, I'm very, very much in the live delivery space. Yes. Yeah. Stand up, standing up and talking. Uh, and I think it's a really powerful tool that gets overlooked a lot in business. Uh, and I encourage people to make use of going out and finding people and standing up in front of them and talking to them. Cause you know, if you nail it, it's amazing. And it's so much more powerful than any number of Google ads or thousands of pounds worth of, of social media. It's there's something about that live connection. And again, harking back to all the stuff that I've done over the past decade, thinking about theater and engagement and connection and, and, and what it is about live delivery that does it. Yes. I, I, that I think is really exciting. It's, a, it's an underused tool. So I help people, encourage people to make use of that in business as a marketing tool. Uh, and, uh, but also, you know, pitching for business and that kind of stuff, making sure mm. those presentations work and do what you need them to without compromising who you are. Uh, mm. Lots of people sort of say, you know, it's about doing what works for the audience, but it's also about showing who you are and telling your story in the most effective way. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so that's on the business side. And then I do a, a lot of work with academia as well. I, I, you know, I, when I left, stopped working at the Centre for Life, I couldn't take running Bright Club with me, the comedy, the comedy night. Mm. But it was the thing I most wanted to, um, because research is fascinating. I mean, you know, there's, there's thousands, hundreds of thousands of people uh, in the country working on astonishing new innovations and new bits of project and interesting stories and uncovering the past and working out how human beings work and how societies work and um uh, and that, and I, I have this science knowledge as well. So I spend quite a lot of time working with science researchers, looking at how they're communicating their work, both right. outside of academia, um, so to to the public and kind of public engagement schemes, but also to industry, to industry partners. Um, a lot of funding in academia now has some sort of industry collaboration thing. They're looking for ways to spin stuff out and commercialize things. And the way academics talk is a sort of strange. Uh, eclectic specialist sort of, I guess any, any expertise has its own specialist language uh, and, and way of doing things. And academia is like that, but more and more they're having to interact with the world outside of academia. Uh, and so helping them do that in a way that works and is, is effective, I think is, is really important. So I have these two strands of the business. There's academia on the one hand and there's uh, businesses on the other. Uh, and I, I love both. I enjoy both with an equal equal measure i wouldn't like to give up either you know everyone says make your business a really focused thing but i, I like doing both sides of that yeah well why not <laughs> yeah i mean it, it's really interesting i i have to send you uh, maybe you know about it but there is when you're talking about academia and things um a few years ago i came across this article which talks about storytelling in research you know, mm -hmm. so when when they write up their um, their you know uh, research papers, papers, yeah, and stuff. yeah, yeah. Um, that they actually you know write it from a place of sharing it as a story, or yeah. at least you know a, a large part of it in story format. I know you've got to have the you know the stats and everything else, but there's a lot of power in in the in the science community about using that properly as uh, yeah so it's it's i mean storytelling so i got to storytelling and i guess this is how i found you really but i i got to storytelling through this emotional engagement piece you know, engaged mm. emotional engagement being the, the seems to be somewhere and i haven't quite worked it out yet but this core of the way human beings interact and storytelling is a fantastic tool for getting at that emotional engagement and and the techniques of storytelling lend themselves very well to that and all you know i have yet to see a presentation that couldn't be framed as a story even even the driest of academic talks can be seen as a story particularly academia actually they are doing you know, they're solving problems fundamentally. They they look around themselves and they see a problem with the world. You know, we don't understand this thing well enough or we could make that treatment for a, a medical treatment better or we could, you know, if we understand this culture better, we can work out how it's going to impact the planet or, or whatever. And then they and then they work out how to solve it. They're, it's it's a big story and, and then they succeed or they don't succeed or they add a bit of new knowledge or they've got somewhere else to go. And that's... That's fascinating. You know, the stats and the numbers are, are back up for all of that and it's and you need it. In just the same way, if you're doing a, a business presentation, 
uh, reporting back, say to the to the C suite. Yeah. Uh, the 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 finance folk may be really interested in some of the details and the numbers, but the numbers on their own don't really mean very much. You know, what does it mean if we've made more this year than last year, or, or lost more? What? How does that impact the story of the company and the story mm. that we're going and telling? And I, I think lots of people see stories as, as just a very you know limited to just case studies or examples. And you can use all the techniques in those spaces, but it's also, it's just, you know, a story is just stuff, you know, stuff that happens. There's a great book uh, about history called History. It's just one thing after another, isn't it? <laughs> uh, you know, it's just one thing happening after another. I, yeah. it's, it's a quote from the History Boys, the, the play and the film The History Boys. And I, I, yeah, and so are stories. Stories are one thing happening, one, you know, at a time. It's a, mm. it's a narrative of things occurring. And everything we do in life is a narrative of things occurring, cause and event. Yeah. Tensions, people want something, people not being able to get it. How do they get it? Oh, it's a story. Uh, how do they solve this problem? People having issues that they need to fix and coming up with solutions. And that's, you know, I, I've never really seen it as not storytelling. Mm. Um, I, I, because if you just do information transfer, nobody is going to be interested in that because information no. and, da- and data and numbers on their own don't mean anything. The no. impact numbers have, what they're going to change, that means something. And that's always a story. You know, that, that it's changing. This is going to change this. This is the new future we'll get if we implement this scheme or we go for this business model or we get this deal, then our future will look like this. That, that's a little story you're telling there about how the future is going to be. Yeah. And, um, yeah, and so you can you can take all of these techniques from a, an art form that is you know, just about as old as humans. We've been telling stories for most of our existence, uh, and and is well known and, and examine and you can apply all of those techniques to presentations of business, of research, of whatever you like, mm. as a way to engage audiences. And and yeah, I think that's better. I, I would say I would say our audiences deserve to be engaged. <laughs> <laughs> Most presentations are potentially a bit boring. Ninety nine point nine percent of them are. But uh, you'd so, go for that, would you? Okay, that high. <laughs> yeah, that high. Um, you know, I've, I've, I, I've been to a lot of presentations in my time, and I can count on one hand the ones that I found interesting, excluding TED talks, of course, because I like them, Duncan. Um, but I, I, I have a question for you. Okay. Because you mentioned earlier on, you said oh, it's about, you know, in the live delivery space, because of obviously your theatre background and doing stuff live and getting that emotional engagement. So I'm, I'm curious because somebody saw me speak once and they went, why are you acting? <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, okay. um, why, why are you why are you kind of like you're on stage? Uh, why are you behaving in such a way? And I went, ah, oh, that's a good question. I don't know why I'm doing it, but it's, it's, I guess it's natural for me to do it to get people's attention um, in, you know, making my voice go in a certain way mm-hmm. or my body language move in a certain way rather than just stand there still. Um, so I'm curious, when you're teaching people, training them how to do live speaking, I mean, we all know it's like the second worst fear after death. Yes. Uh, huge, public speaking. Yeah. yeah. Nobody likes it. Everybody detests it. And most people aren't good at it. No. Unless you've had a lot of training. And of course, with your interventions, I don't know how long they are to train people, but Will they ever become like a, you know, go on the speaking circuit after one training session? But do you encourage them to, you know, get a bit lively with it? Uh, if Yeah, if it suits, but only if it suits them and it suits the content. Right. So one of the things when I, I was having, um, one of the interesting things throughout, I guess, all of the last... 10 years about that I've been thinking about all this stuff and paying attention to it in one form or another is, as I said, you know, when I started at life, I, I'd done theater, I knew theater. I thought this was how it would be. Mm. And, and one of the, the corners I got knocked off me was that presentations are not the same. And when you aren't working with people who either are professional actors or are behaving like professional actors in the kind of the high level student scene where I did most of my theater, you can't ask the same things of them. Mm. 
Um, and it was about the same time, it was about the time that I went, I started this business that my brother started his, his professional acting training. Yes. So we were having really interesting conversations about how he was being trained and why, what he was doing and what he does on stage is very different to how I would train a presenter to present right. and what I would encourage them to do. Um, presenting, good presenting isn't axing. Mm. Uh, there are similarities. Mm. There are there are tricks of the trade that both trades share, but what actors do is they summon up and uh, be, are, whatever it is they're feeling, you know, whatever the character is, and they can right. do that on, on cue. And they train long, you know, it's three years of six days a week training, uh, my brother did, uh, to enable you to do the mental gymnastics that lets you do that with an integrity and a truth. Right. So, so, you know, I, I once joked with my brother, that he, you know, he's just on stage pretending to do stuff. And he, he really seriously, he said, no, 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 no. When, when the good actors are on stage, they are that thing. Yeah. Right. So they kind of, they, they mentally can become it and portray it really on stage. And this is one of the things that's interesting because presenters don't have that level of training. No. Uh, when, when they try and portray something that is, a little bit too or a little bit distant from themselves or not quite matching with their personality if they try to push it too far mm. it can come across as fake inauthentic yeah inauthentic yeah so an actor trains really hard to to make sure that it's not at all it isn't it isn't because they are being authentic they can just do whatever it is in the moment yes whereas presenters need need to balance uh, the, the slightly liveliness and we're on stage so we need to be a little bit bigger and the kind of body language that comes with the impression we're trying to give with keeping our own personality there because because most of the time we haven't got the training to push beyond into something that really isn't us and keep it feel like a, a real thing a real person on stage got it, yeah. and the audience spot this and they respond to it and I'm sure you've seen speakers that you felt looked a bit fake or a bit wooden mm. or mm. Uh, and you can see, I did a, a, a TEDx talk about in February last year mm. and uh, watching, you know, I think I did a pretty good job, but watching it back and knowing my own performance style, it's uh, a slightly too performed. Just, just an edge, just an edge of it that's a little bit too, I don't know, forced or, or um, yeah, performed, I think is the right word. Just slightly too careful. If I'd relaxed, a fraction more showed a little bit more of me. Yeah, been happy putting a little bit more of myself and my, my vulnerability on that stage. Mm. It would have made, I think, for a more compelling performance. And that's mm. one of the one of the key kind of differences, I think. So, so yeah. So you do you do borrow the tricks. You're on stage. You, you're further away from people. You need to be a bit bigger. You need to project your voice. You need to have body language that's a bit bigger so that people can see it. Uh, you need to infuse emotion into stuff, maybe when you don't feel that emotion right at the minute. But the key is it, it's, it's always your emotion. Yes. It's always a thing you would feel or you, you would think or you would take on board. It's not something you're not trying to summon up a fake thing that you don't really know how to portray it because uh, the audience will always spot that. And, That's and, uh, brilliant. And, yeah. <laughs> and we don't like spotting people that look fake. You know, the, the biggest thing one of the most engaging things for a presenter to do on stage is, is be authentically themselves. Mm. Uh, it's just very difficult to do uh, and often doesn't come with some of the other stuff that is required on stage, like being heard and being seen, which requires a little bit of falseness. It's this, it's this strange halfway space between being really honestly yourself as you would be with your friends down the pub yes. uh, and, and being a crew slightly created thing for the audience and the falseness of the environment of a presentation. Yeah. I, I, I the beautifully explained. Thank you so much. That is I, just, I do think so. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely brilliant because I have definitely seen it where people who have been on speaker training and are using it at networking events in the mm -hmm. main, or it, maybe they have to do a presentation and they use it in there. But particularly, it's about like the 60 second commercial or the yeah. five minute talk or whatever. And they push it too much. And you kind of go, I don't know. I don't can't see who you are anymore. You know, 
you don't look like yourself. You look like you you're forcing it too much. You you've rehearsed it too much, and you you're desperate to remember the words that you rehearse to get the pitch perfect. And actually, there is no natural way of delivering it that is at ease with who you are, and you know you're you're kind of relaxed into the space rather than kind of sitting outside of the space and forcing your alter ego to kind of deliver something that is over rehearsed, well rehearsed, and right, I've done it now. I can go back to myself again. Yeah. Exactly. It's and and that's that's sort of stra- it. It's sort of strange and off-putting to work with. Um, that networking sort of falseness often and, and presentation falseness often stems from I see this all the time it, because being on stage in front of lots of people or standing up at a networking event in front of lots of people is a, is a scary place. You know, it's mm-hmm. it's difficult. It's vulnerable. You feel you know, rabbit in headlights that everybody's looking at you, and and often you feel like everybody's judging you, even though they're, they're not. Um, and, and so we, we wrap ourselves in various sorts of protection and armor and things, you know, the, the most common one being closed body language. Uh, you know, we like to tuck in and we cross our arms or we cross our legs or our shoulders hunch up or we put our hands in our pockets, or we, we take a step backwards, you know, we, we try and stand away from presentation or we, or we stand behind a lectern because then that puts a block yes. between us and these people who are looking at us. Yeah. Uh, or, we, or we try and deflect all of the attention onto the PowerPoint so that everybody's looking at that, not at you. Oh, um, yeah. so, so that's that's the kind of the obvious ones. But we we also wrap ourselves in sort of false personalities. We, we create what we think they want to see, you know, is this professional thing or assured and we write a script so we get all the words right we create this sort of veneer to protect ourselves from that that vulnerability you know for, for being open and, and being vulnerable and the real skill yeah. is learning to to accept that vulnerability and get comfortable with sharing a bit of it doesn't have to be all of yourself you know and it certainly doesn't have to be bits of yourself that you would really rather people weren't aware of mm. but but just a little enough of yourself that you seem like a real person you know? we all have different different persons that we play right you know, the person mm-hmm. at home that you play at home is not the same person that you you play when you're out networking or doing a business deal it's not the same person you play uh with a particular group of friends uh down the pub that might be different to uh, the, the person you play with a different group of friends you know we all have these sort of they're still us we're made up of these faceted personalities and i, I kind of try and get people to find a, a presentation person uh, you know, so if, if you were to draw my, my presentation person in caricature, I, I laugh more than I do. It sounds really sad. Um, I, laugh, <laughs> I laugh slightly more when I'm on stage. Um, yes. I, I tend to actually be, I think, be quicker and funnier and sharper. I'm a bit more confident on stage. Right. Uh, but it's still me. It's not a confidence I don't have. It's just, it's not a confidence I have all the time, you know? Uh, so rather than I, I try and, I try and get people away from this idea of creating a, it's almost like, it's like marketing. So I, I, I work quite a lot with, with marketeers, uh, in the, in the business community and, and you, you see the, the, you know, they, they create these wonderful flashy marketing campaigns, but if the marketing campaign isn't representative of the business or the product. The, the customers are going to say, well, what is this? I'm not interested. You know, you're, you're selling a falsity here. I don't mm. want to buy it. Mm. And more and more marketing campaigns are going for a transparency thing, a, mm-hmm. a vulnerability, opening up those vulnerabilities of companies. And that's, I think, again, that's getting at what human beings engage with. Fundamentally, we engage with other human beings. Yeah. And, and so if you want people to engage, showing yourself a bit as a human being is, is really key. Now, whether you can, you absolutely can learn to do it the way that you, you create a persona, a proper armored persona, and then you work at making that seem natural, sort of what actors do. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and you can do that. And sometimes I find clients who find it very difficult to be themselves due to you know, for whatever reason. Uh, and so we, we do go down that route. We do, I can almost fake it till you make it approach. You know, this is the body language. This is the the vocal variation and stuff you need to do to, to feel like you're coming off as real, even though you feel very fake, you can work that way. Uh, and that's fine because at the end of the day, it matters what the audience sees, not necessarily how you feel. 
Sure. Or, um, in terms of whether a presentation is effective or, or not effective. But I think it's faster for people to get good and comfortable presenting if they can they can work out this sort of presentation personality bit of themselves. Mm. Um, and that's different for everybody. You know, I'm I'm quite a bouncy, lively presenter, and uh, but not everybody is. So not all personalities suit that kind of approach. Not all yeah. subjects suit that kind of approach. So I ask, I get people to be lively when lively is the right thing to be. Uh, but otherwise, no. Um, sometimes I get people coming up to me after I've done a training session or a talk or something and going, "Don't really good," but you know, I can. I, I don't feel confident. I'm shy. I don't like speaking up. I don't think I could be that kind of person. I go, "Well, you don't have. You know, it's not about being me. It's, it's not about being. You know, all those TED speakers that you look up to and going, oh, they're great, but they're a million miles from me. I could never be that.' There's no yeah. one one way of doing it. There's a great quote, and I always forget who it was. Uh, who said it, or where I read it, where I found it, but it said, uh, quiet has a voice as well. And often quiet is the yes. most powerful voice in the room. Yes. And it just really resonates with me because in a, in a, in a room or in a space, often where there's lots of people being loud and trying to show off, if you can, if you're the quiet voice that has something powerful to say, mm. great. Well, we do that. And People will listen because it's compelling and it's different. And, um, you know, so it's, it's it, you know, and I guess this is why I love it for me as much as anything else. Every new client, every new person I work with is, is a journey, finding out what works for them, what doesn't work for them, testing my, my sets of skills and exercises I use to help people to see, is this the one that's going to help you find your, your feet, find your voice, find your, your persona, or, or are we going to have to go through the list and, you know, keep trying stuff until something mm. matches? Yeah. Um, so it's, it's always a journey, but yeah, everyone's different and every audience is different. And, uh, it's one of the reasons that if you Google presentation skills, you do these top 10 things to talk mm. like a TED speaker, do this, 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 mm. and they all, they all tend to be generic, good advice. Mm. Um, you know, don't mumble, move your hand, have generally open body language, etc., etc. Um, but if you tie yourself to a recipe, um, a, it may be a recipe that was written for somebody else who isn't you. Uh, and B, the situations get different. You know, a recipe that works for your 60 seconds networking is not the same recipe that's going to work for a TED talk, is, is not the same recipe that's going to work for a, a business pitch. So learning to understand the goal and, and, and the different, the various different ways of getting emotional engagement, including storytelling, helps you adapt, helps you respond, helps you be flexible. And yeah. I think that's a more powerful approach than trying to treat, you know, give, give 10 things to do these and you'll become a spectacular speaker. Because that's, in my experience, not how it works. And and people can't remember. And what if? And the other thing is, you 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 go, oh, I didn't do that thing, and then everyone's noticed. Or mm. yeah, it just you just tie yourself up in knots, don't you? And Absolutely. That yeah. Sorry. Okay. No, I I I agree with you a hundred percent. I I like I I like the fact that. You know, you're saying it. It really depends on the individual and their character and their personality, and working with that, rather than saying, you know, these are the things. Okay, there are always like a foundation, but yeah. beyond that, don't try and be, you know, Robert De Niro, or don't try and be George Clooney. Just, just be yourself uh, at the end of the day, and. Talk how you would speak normally. Um, yeah, we all have to emphasize something, don't we? We all have to go into a space to get our voice heard or so people can pay attention to it. But again, you don't need to necessarily use acting, but you can use storytelling to get people's attention. Um, it, yeah, and, and other bits, you know, that, that piece of advice, just be yourself, is, is sort of, it's simultaneously correct and really unhelpful. Uh, you know, I find cause, cause it's I, I, at the point in time when people are often told it, they're feeling nervous and scared and, mm. uh, uh, uncertain and insecure. And then, and then they go, well, what if I put all of that on stage? Everyone's going to hate me. Um, yes. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's this, as a, you know, it's this weird halfway space between being, you know, being a caricature of yourself, 
mm. the caricature the audience wants to see. So you make the, the funnier bits bigger and the more confident bits bigger or the more authoritative bits or the more serious and powerful bits bigger, whichever bits work for your presentation. Mm. And you minimize the bits that are insecure and the voices that are telling you no, the bits that get scared, the bits that feel vulnerable, the bits that, you know, sit in their pants and watch Netflix all weekend. Because, you know, we all do that, but nobody really needs to see that bit of people on stage. And no. that's 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 fine that's how it works but it's it's still a skill and i yeah i i think it's just one of these sort of odd things that we're not quite prepared for the closest i think people come to it is when they uh in just everyday life is when they have a passionate conversation yeah yeah if yeah. if you can take your passionate conversation self mm. and put it on stage with a little bit of tweaking and a little bit of theatricality and a little bit of storytelling here and there, maybe slightly more dramatic pauses, that kind of thing. If you can do if but if you can put that passionate person, focused, engaged, emotional person on stage, people are going to be interested. Yeah. That's great advice. Yeah. Not easy to do, but it is it nope. is the best advice I've heard for a while. Oh, thanks. And if it was easy, I wouldn't need a, I wouldn't be in this business. It no, sounds it sounds really <laughs> easy, yeah. <laughs> It sounds easy. Yeah. Okay. Um, obviously, you're 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 up in Newcastle, but presumably yeah. you can train people all over the country and abroad as well, if need be. Uh, yes, indeed. Yes, yeah. so I, I travel up and down the country uh, regularly, uh, often to, to sort of the bigger organisations who want me to do group training uh, type mm. stuff, like the universities. Um, but I get individual clients from from yeah all over the country and all over the world, working remotely via Zoom and via Skype. Yeah. Um, and doing, so I have a, a video feedback system as well. So, uh, people oh, can great. send me videos of themselves and yeah. we annotated comments and kind of conversations about stuff. And I, so, and we either have just Skype calls to talk about stuff or they send me a video of them doing something or their slide deck and, and I put notes on that and then we have a conversation about it. That sounds um, awesome. So yeah, so I'm kitted out to work with anyone anywhere. Really. So tell us where people can find you and your social media channels i'll put it uh, in the show notes anywhere but do it verbally in case people are driving or yeah in case people miss me so uh the website is is duncanyellowlees.com because if you end up with a unique name you might as well use it yes uh, uh and uh, and then my my social presence is linkedin mostly uh, and a bit of twitter as well um both of those places are good places to find me um, and, and is yeah, there a story behind the name the surname is there a story behind the surname <laughs> So, Yellow Lees, uh, we, there's not many of us. No. Uh, we know there is a, a couple of generations back. My granddad, maybe, or my great granddad made a book uh, called The Yellow Lees Book, trying to trace the family tree. Um, and we are, we're part of the Robertson clan in Scotland. So, we're kind of entitled to the, the ancient Robertson Tartan in that kind of way. Uh, and it's a Scottish name. For quite a while back, we found a, the first mention we found of it is about 1208 or something uh, at Roxburgh Castle right. in the Scottish border, in the Scottish borders. So, you know, my parents grew up elsewhere and I returned to the Scottish borders, which seems to be the historic home of, of the name. Mm. Uh, and Alexander Yellowlees was hung in Roxburgh Castle. <gasps> uh, uh, yeah, and we don't know. Roxburgh oh, Castle, for people who don't know, it's right on the border and, and through its history, it has... Uh, it's, you know, it's been held by the English and held by the Scottish and held by the English and back again. And we're not, nobody's quite sure of whether he was hung by the English for helping the Scottish or whether he was hung by the Scottish for helping the English or, or something. It's all a bit fuzzy, but he was hung at Roxburgh Castle for some unknown level of transaction. Oh, wow. But there are, you know, there are yellow leases in, in the immigration from Scotland country. So there's some of us in, there's a branch in Canada and mm -hmm. North America uh, and, uh, found the only other Duncan Yellow Lees I've been able to find uh, died in 1850 something I think wow. and is in a cemetery in Australia <laughs> uh, so yeah so it's a it's a kind of Scottish uh, Scottish Scottish border's name uh, but where it comes from before that I don't know because it's not it doesn't feel like a Scottish word it feels like you know, like a Scandinavian word or perhaps a, a bastardization of the French fleur-de-lis which is obviously the, the gold kind of yes. uh, symbol the French have the fleur-de-lis yes. Uh, the yellow fleur de lis, the yellow yes. lee, the yellow lees. But yeah, it's all guesswork. But we don't know. It doesn't. It's not as. It doesn't tie in with the, the same sort of phonetics and pattern of the older Scottish family names. So we're not quite sure where it comes from before then. Sounds very good, Duncan. 
It sounds re a really interesting story. And probably you will learn more when you get a bit older and you're going to go, right, I've got some time on my hands now. Going to go I'm, and find out. Yeah, yeah I'm going <laughs> to I'm going to trace my genealogy and find out where they've all come from. And um, a fascinating, fascinating thing to do anyway. Brilliant. Well, I, I really appreciate your time and some fantastic tips. I, I think speaking in public, live speaking, is probably the most important skill any small business needs to possess. So if Absolutely there's any small great. businesses listening, please get in touch with Duncan. Um, all his details are in the podcast notes. Uh, find them on LinkedIn, on Twitter, wherever. I'll, I'll put the note. The notes are all there. So um, go and get trained on how to speak properly. I know we have a mutual friend, which is Richard Tubb. So just a quick shout yes. out in case he's listening. And hey, Richard. And I know Richard's had worries about his public speaking, and I'm, I'm pleased to know that you've helped him a little bit as well, which is great yes, news. Yeah. Um, he's, he's a great public speaker, but I know he, he, fear, he has nerves or something that he struggles with sometimes. Yes, indeed. We did, we did some stuff around slide design as well and, and structuring his talks and his preparation process, making that streamlined again to help with the nerves so it doesn't all feel like too much and you don't quite know where you're going. Brilliant. Uh, Oh, that sounds good. Sounds good. And if you're ever in the Midlands, uh, Birmingham area, whatever, let me know and I'll buy you some lunch if you have time on the day, whatever you're up to. That would be delightful, Michael. I absolutely will. So thank you. Goodbye and take care. Yeah, you too. Goodbye. Thanks very much. Bye for now. Cheers. Bye-bye. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. 